Julie Smith, been with DuPont for almost 30 years. I've seen, you know, a lot of changes in the industry and I've seen some change in the process automation industry as well. I started my career as, you know, a, a plant engineer, just trying to figure out, you know, how to make the plant run and how to solve, you know, quality and operation problems. And then after I'd been there about a year, someone told me there were these new things called distributed control systems, I've kind of been hooked on process control ever since. We've got you know, various control systems at our sites today um, from lots of different vendors, different vintages and generations, and but, uh, but uh, you know, a common thing that we need to keep them running, we need to make sure that, you know, they are effectively collecting data to support our processes to enable us to stay ahead of the competition to figure out how we can you know, make our products better. How can we improve our quality? I'm Brandon Williams, co-founder of Silicon Valley software company, Seaplane AI. And I will be your host for this podcast to introduce you to many of the companies and leaders that are transforming industrial process automation through the Open Process Automation Forum. In this podcast, you will get a close-up look of the rapid change in the entire ecosystem of industrial process automation. The open process automation standard, now entering its third major version, has already moved from an idea onto paper and now in pilot tests and proofs of concept by leading companies such as BASF and ExxonMobil. So tune in to this guided tour by the experts and decide for yourself if you want to be involved in the imminent future of innovation and commercial adoption of truly open, interoperable, and inherently secure process automation technologies. We're going to start our presentation with someone who has been involved with open process automation from the beginning. Don, please introduce yourself and OPATH. Don Bartusiak is my name. I am the Chief Engineer for Process Control and ExxonMobil Research and Engineering. I've been working in automation and control for about 35 years. Uh, the vast majority of that was with, with Exxon or ExxonMobil. You know, with respect to open process automation, you have to see we're about 10, 10 or so years into a journey that we started about 2010, uh, an R&D project, to meet a very big business challenge that we had with our the existing technologies that are used for industrial control. What, what we learned along the way is the, the, the transformational change that we're seeking is not going to come from, you know, continuous incremental evolution of the technologies that we currently have. It was going to require a big transformation moving away from proprietary closed systems towards standards-based open interoperable technologies because that's what we saw in uh, applicable adjacent industries like telecommunications, like avionics. And so that's really the motivation and kind of the big headline idea uh, that, that, need, that, that would be the key takeaway in terms of what's driving open process automation. Thank you, Don. From uh, this realization of the need for change, can you comment more specifically on the business drivers that made open systems such an important initiative for the industry? The business problems are, are you know, traditionally the ones that motivate all for-profit enterprises. It's what, you know, what do we have to do to enable us to contribute more value to the corporation? So some of the constraints that we have with the currently available products and the way the, the industrial control industry is structured is that we, the end user companies, uh, are impeded um, with respect to introducing new technologies, be they of a hardware or software nature, because of the closed and proprietary nature of the currently available products. So that. So barriers on new technology insertion for the purpose of uh, in increasing the value contribution to the company, that's one, that's one uh, motivation, and breaking those constraints is the value proposition. The second one is uh, really on the cost side of the ledger. 
Um, one of the the, the uh, consequences of, of of these closed proprietary systems is um, the units that have to be changed are you can't you can't break apart once those once those things are inside of a monolithic closed system. So if you want to do a relatively simple thing like upgrade a compute capability because of Moore's law or improvements in software or operating systems, when you have closed coupled close coupled and proprietarily connected components, you can't upgrade component pieces. And the cost to us, the asset owning company, is when we want to do upgrades on these systems, it is an extremely disruptive and extremely costly proposition. So that's why we want to move towards standards-based uh, open uh, technologies where the interfaces are defined such that we can upgrade components when there's a value proposition to do so, not because the supplier has decided to, let's say, discontinue a product line. You know, the currently available products were designed uh, in an era before we had this ubiquitous internet connectivity and all of the cybersecurity risks that we, we are, you know, currently have to mitigate. And incorporating, you know, designed in cybersecurity uh, characteristics of the systems that we want to have, that, that would be a third uh, mechanism of, of business benefit. Okay, so how then does the OPATH model differ from what came before? So what, what OPA's reference architecture, which is depicted in, in the slide that you have up here, uh, Brandon, it, it kind of recalibrates us to the, com the highly distributable compute technology that we currently have. So in the OPA reference architecture at the bottom of the stack, uh, you see these devices, the acronym DCN, which stands for Distributed Compute Node. That's where we envision the actual edge layer of computing technology. The, the middle bar there is the networking technology, where in contrast to proprietary protocols where a device can only speak to a device made by the same manufacturer. We want to use, you know, Ethernet-based industry standards technologies to, to achieve interoperability. And then the ACP, which stands for Advanced Compute Platform, is a, a way of realizing highly scalable compute power akin to what the IT companies do now in data centers and in the cloud, but in a small on-premise footprint that's fit for purpose for the, the, the requirements of the applications that we use to control a plant. So it's a shift away from what was ba basically an outdated architectural principle towards a, an architecture that's grounded more in the computing and networking capabilities of today and looking into the future. So then, which parts or layers of the automation system are covered by the OPA standard? And perhaps equally as important, what's excluded from the standard? So in scope of, of OPA would be, or is rather, the input-output modules that are used, whether you have a DCS, a distributed control system, or a PLC system. The DCS uh, itself or the PLCs themselves and the, the layer of computing technology that is immediately above the DCS or the PLC. So that is what's in scope. The field devices and the communicate the field field devices means sensors and final control elements and the communications to the sensors and final control elements is out of scope. The business computing system is out of scope. The safety instrumented system, AKA safety shutdown system, is out of scope. My name is Kirk Smith. I'm a um, principal engineer and director uh, within Intel's industrial solution division. The scope of my current responsibilities in Intel are that I lead an industrial architecture team responsible for delivering a variety of reference solutions to the market for the ODM and OEM and 
SI ecosystem that we work with in the industrial domain. We believe that with the IoT transformation and the associated changes that are expected in the industrial space, we see them accelerating. We believe IT practices are being adopted more and more in the OT domains and uh, the standardization in that space is critical to the realization of true interoperability and portability for the, the process and discrete industries at large. I'm pleased to welcome Luis Duran from ABB to the podcast. My name is Luis Duran. I'm product line manager with uh, ABB uh, in the process control platform, part of the industrial automation group. You know, with the forum, uh, one of the co-chairs with the business working group for AB, uh, this initiative is quite important. You know, for AB as a leader in DCS, really, we see that part of our success has been to be continuously transforming the DCS in response to end use driven initiatives. Right now, we see this uh, transition towards this converged IT OT systems and different type of architectures. And we see OPAF as one uh, very important industry effort that will accelerate these transformations. Luis, how is OPAF different from other standard efforts that you are aware of? We are developing a standard of standards, and we're driving towards an open, secure, and interoperable products as defined by these standards. One of the uh, nice elements that we have in the forum is the membership. And I mentioned before this uh, active participation from uh, operating companies in the industry is really, really uh, very valuable. We have people from uh, the chemical space, pharmaceutical, pulp and paper, uh, oil and gas. We have automation suppliers, uh, hardware and software suppliers for that, system integrators, you know, over 90 uh, different members actively participating in the development of this stand. We're building on the success that have been achieved by other initiatives uh, that the uh, Open Group sponsor. FACE was one of those initiatives that basically as a model um, aerospace industry, we have experiences from the telecommunication industry that we are bringing into play. So overall, we are uh, combining a very diverse set of experiences and domain knowledge and needs to make uh, this standard of standards uh, a reality. Welcome, Julie Smith from DuPont. Julie, what makes OPAF compelling to you? Well, I think as you look across the top of this chart here, you can see you know many different industries represented in the forum, and they're very diverse. Um, you know the the business model and, and needs of oil and gas are quite different from specialty chemical manufacturers like us or, or pharmaceuticals. Um, but we all have common pain points in dealing with process automation systems. And I think that's what is really nice about this forum and that it brings us together to have a common voice to articulate what are these pain points we're experiencing and how we can work together to affect a change in the industry. Um, you know, we're all seeing that it's becoming harder and harder to integrate best in class components with our um, process automation systems. We're all seeing that cybersecurity is becoming more important, but it's becoming more difficult to do. And it's you know, an afterthought in most cases. Um, we're all seeing that we've got to run systems, you know, past the end of life, but Windows is, you know, turning out a new uh, version every, you know, five years. And we're, there's no way we're going to update our control systems that frequently. So there's many common threads that allow us from, you know, these very diverse industries to, to band together and, and say, look, you know, our, uh, our colleagues in IT have, have figured out ways to address these challenges. Um, you know, we as OT need to uh, to figure out a way to do the same. Okay, so how would you as a process automation practitioner then expect the process automation industry to change with the adoption of the OPA standard? Well, I, I think we're going to see, you know, breaking down of the silos, particularly in, in the hardware arena. I mean, there's just no standardization today. There's tremendous benefit for end users to have a consolidation there so that we don't have to have 
you know, dedicated staff maintaining the systems just because they came from a different vendor. The hardware itself is, is becoming more commodity. We've certainly seen that in the IT world, and I think it's, it, it's just a, it's a matter of time before it happens in the OT world as well. And then what benefits do you anticipate will come from end users implementing systems that conform to the standard? Certainly the, the one you have in the center there, uh, multi-vendor interoperability is, is huge for us. Um, as I mentioned earlier, We've got, you know, many different systems in our plants um, as we've changed through mergers and acquisitions over the years. You know, we've got, you know, pretty much one of everything. Um, but we've all got the same objective in that we're trying to figure out how to, you know, run our plants, you know, smarter, more effectively um, and, and bring new products to market. So any way that we can leverage solutions even though we have multi-vendors, is going to be a huge win for us. Um, also, security, as I mentioned, you know, we, we know that cybersecurity is only going to get more important. Uh, you know, the old days of security by obscurity are, are gone. For either of you, why is creating a standard largely from existing standards important? Hopefully one way um, it's important is that it'll allow us to get to the end result faster. Yeah, and, and that, that's right. I mean, I think that I see, one, the acceleration of uh, the, the implementation of products that already, you know, might have certain uh, suppliers might have already the expertise with uh, some of these standards and implementing the products, but also you know, having really the benefit of, uh, of that expertise brought into the automation arena by, by you know, this exercise of, uh, of creating a standard of a standards within the OPAS, we, we can benefit and, and leverage that experience from the other industries into the uh, industrial automation space and make our system more uh, resilient, uh, let's say, easily, uh, easier to evolve, easier to, to move forward into the future. You know, one of the, the differences that the forum brings, we, we see that a key success factor for the forum is to be able to uh, review and ensure that every product that is uh, uh, the develop following the the, the standard uh, fulfills and demonstrate conformance to 100 percent of the specification yeah i think that's something that we're going to look for um i think when we look to purchase um you know these 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 systems and components we're going to you know ask are are you certified and there's going to be a registry that we are able to go and verify hey oh well, yes you know joe's product it is yep it's listed in the registry it's certified okay that's great that means it passed the test that we know it's going to work we can you know we can plug it in with confidence uh Jacques Opier. i'm based in the netherlands uh working for shell um I'm in the process automation space, I think overall for more than 30 years. In my role, I look at what's the next step for Shell. I'm also working on other strategies which are related to uh, uh, process automation. This is once in a lifetime uh, opportunity to uh, do something like what we're doing today, uh, help to make uh, some basic choices on, uh, on, on the road we're going to follow for the next uh, a couple of years. So that's what I do. Welcome, Jock, to the podcast. What does Shell hope to gain from the OPA standard? OPAF is important because it will provide us with things we don't have today. So if if the world is changing around us and, and our company is changing and all the companies are changing, or uh, these are disruptive times, if you will, our, our process control is gonna play a bigger role and you know we have to you know prepare ourselves for for a more flexible way of working and that's where we said you know we need to come up with a strategy that allows us to do that the way to do that nowadays is to standardize on more open platforms and the opof was the obvious candidate for that so um, so shell joined opof i think in 2018 
Opov is already seen as a, a very credible uh, uh, solution by the whole industry, so that's also why, why we, we joined. So basically, technology uh, and the technology outlooks, um, which are you know, difficult to achieve uh, with, the, uh, with the current systems. So Shell is a large end user of process automation systems, and how will the OPA standard influence the way the whole ecosystem of suppliers, system integrators, and others uh, work together in a more open and innovative marketplace? Yeah, for the industry, it's, it, it's disruptive. As the technology changes fast, the question is, can we keep up with the technology we're facing with the technology we use currently? Uh, that's really a question. And, and I think another question is, can our current suppliers keep all the balls in the air um, without, you know, collaboration? So if you, if you think about how fast things are changing and how fast the market is, is adopting, how the end user companies are changing, I think all those changes together uh, actually require us to uh, collaborate more and to make sure that Together we can uh, get the products and the systems we need and want. Altogether we have to work towards a model that works uh, in this more complex world uh, and a more flexible world and a faster moving world. And, you know, I think our current model doesn't allow us to do that, if you will. And as we come to our conclusion, we have invited one of the leading contributors of the forum to share some closing thoughts. So let me start. My name is Ron Bro. I'm a director of industrial solutions market development. I work for Wind River Systems. We develop software and provide professional services for the embedded or uh, intelligent edge market, as it's called today. Working in OPAF gives us a clear firsthand understanding of our customers' pain points. And from a Wind River perspective, this helps us fine tune our product strategy and ensure we're making investments that deliver the most value to our customers. Working hand in hand on complex business and technical issues as we do with our customers and our competitors establishes um, a strong environment, I'd say, of mutual respect and collaboration. Rather than just being faceless names, uh, the kind of interactions that you have when developing standards like this, it really helps to foster meaningful relationships with people. And uh, honestly, you can't put a price on something like that. Ron, you and Wind River have contributed a lot to the momentum of the OPA standard. What would you say to those companies still sitting on the fence about becoming involved? Momentum is building at this point to produce fully interoperable components from multiple vendors in 2020 and 2021. And in order to support viable products, we're creating the testing and certification mechanisms right now through the end of the year. Um, you see here a picture of the train, and I would say that that train has already left the station. Uh, open interoperable systems for process automation are inevitable at this point, and uh, you really need to, um, to get engaged and get on board um, so that you can be part of it as well. Um, in terms of learning more about OPAF and uh, you know how do you how do you uh, get the materials that you need to come up to speed? Well, I'd say if, if you've made it this far into the webinar, um, I really do hope you'll reach out to us. Um, we have these links that are provided. Um, they can take you to the OPAF website. You can read back and get information. Uh, we have contacts in there. We have new companies that are joining us and contributing their voice and perspective and expertise even now. And we would love to have you uh, join as well and be part of this and uh, help us chart uh, the future in uh, process automation.